Chapter Thirty Six, A Bridgerton Novel, The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. We are bringing you another book review on our podcast, and oh boy, do we have something in store for you guys! Starting off with a spoiler-free review, as always, and a summary for our listeners who haven't read the book and want to know why or if they should read it. We will be telling you what to expect if you decide to pick it up, and what makes this book so special. After that, fans of the show and book can join us in a deeper analysis of the characters such as Simon and Daphne, in our more in-depth review. We will be applying themes such as the effect of parenting, portrayal of feminism in the Regency period, as well as a comparison between the inspired characters from the show and the portrayed characters in the novel. We will answer questions like: Could Simon be considered the protagonist of the story? How was Anthony's character depicted differently in the novel? And what effect does bad parenting have on a man's childhood and confidence growing up? We will be discussing all of these questions and with many others. So, turn the page. Welcome to a new chapter of Between the Pages. We are your hosts. I'm your host Nesma, and I'm your host Tanin. We host this podcast together, where we review and recommend books for you to read. We divide our chapter into two categories, starting with a spoiler-free review, where we tell you what the book is about and what we thought about it. Then we move on to a more in-depth analysis of the book where we share our favorite moments, chat about the plot, and contemplate what could happen next in the series. And today we have Bridgerton, a Bridgerton novel, The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. Um, we're gonna, I think, tackle, not I think, I know, we're gonna <laughs> tackle the show, the show and the book yes. um, today. And yeah, just enjoy the ride. <laughs> <laughs> so the show is mostly an inspiration from an inspiration from the book yeah inspiration yeah from the series as a whole let's say mm -hmm. not the first book um but of do course do you think there's a difference between an adaptation and an interpretation yes like adaptations are more of a one-to-one -one, you know uh -huh. with the means possible in like filmmaking you know uh-huh Whereas interpretation, they could take a theme uh, from a book and... Make it completely different. Yes, or just the characters or, you know. Uh, yeah. Like, I studied adaptation in school, in screenwriting, and I remember there were some steps we should take, sort of, that we, we can eliminate characters uh, and, like, and, or combine them, like... Combine like if they have so many friends, we can make them make them just two, and those are mm -hmm. the ones that appear in the film or the show. Okay, okay. Um, we can uh, summarize the events more, like narrow them down, like yeah. just the highlights, uh, like as a basis, and then if we have more space, we fill in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's sort of what they did with Bridgerton, and I think when you read the novel, you can really see that the show and the book, even though they have sort of a lot of similarities, there is still a lot of differences. Um, uh, no, no, no. I think with Bridgerton, they, they did exactly the opposite. Like, the events of the book are there, but there is a lot of fill-in drama and characters. Like, they expanded the characters. In the first I think book, you know? Because I think they took from other Bridgerton novels. Because mm. in each Bridgerton novel, you have one family member from the Bridgerton family um, ex exploring something specific. So, mm -hmm. for example, we have the next novel, which is about Anthony. Um, but it's a little further on um, in the story. Yeah. But maybe there's like information about him or certain things that we don't know. Or things that fill in those gaps from Daphne's story, maybe? I don't know. And we also have, like, characters like Eloise, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of character traits, they take it as well from the book. Like, how do they know what Eloise is like? So they have to read all of the novels to really see what every character 
um, every character's personality. Ah, yes, to present them in the first show and then yeah. build later on, like, with their stories, like, when their stories sort of start, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, it's more of an inspiration than an adaptation. Because yeah. I think they added stuff, like... If we read the synopsis for Anthony's st- story, there is no men- mention of the opera singer. Right. Yeah. So maybe she's in his history, but not in the book. So they like put it, put her in there. Mm-hmm. You no. Know? So I guess there is, and in, in the queen, there is no really not a queen in the book. Yeah, and there's no really a hunt for a lady whistle down. Yes. Um, and which I'm assuming is part of Eloise's story. Yeah, me because too. Because it was her motivation to mm-hmm. find out who she is. So it will come later in the series, as uh, in the book series, I mean. Yeah. And also, uh, how the show looks, the cast. Like, in, in the book, they were all white, <laughs> basically. Caucasian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, while in... Uh, in the show, there were... They were very diverse. Yeah, yeah, yes, very. Like, not just in color, but in ethnicities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell you, I mean, they kind of have to do that because Netflix took on this uh, diversity, equality. Yeah. Yeah. Less, uh, less equality motto or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though I think the casting for Simon was amazing, was spot Com- on, I think. Um, yes. Like, he's not the same Simon in the book, and we're going to talk about that in the spoiler part. Uh, Like, as a character, as a personality, but Uh his story is the same. Like, he went through the same things, so... Yes, yes. They definitely modernized the show a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Julia Quinn's depiction of the Regency period is uh, very accurate in the novel. Mm -hmm. The way women care about their appearances, their skills, and... Um, which makes me wonder sometimes because there was like a scene in the show. I'm I'm assuming that people have watched the show, but this is not really a spoiler. Mm-hmm. But um, like the when the mothers are so desperate to find suitors for their daughters, mm-hmm. they always mention how their daughters are like talented at playing the pianoforte or at dancing or singing. Which makes me wonder: is that really what? Um, males during the that period are actually looking for in a partner you know <laughs> like, yeah oh my god my 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 wife my future wife can sing and dance and play the piano I was like that's not really what you should be looking for <laughs> exactly you should be seeing if she I can mean, be a good mother to your children if she can take care of a house if she if she has know, good ideas and like is educated about yes. the world you know but everything is so oriented about skills. Like, mm-hmm. the woman needs to have skills. Like, she needs to be able to embroider um, or crochet or sing or dance. And it's like, it's, it's of course, it's like objectifying women a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all they're good for. But um, the depiction of it is accurate. You know, yeah. that's what the Regency period was like. This is how women were thinking. And that's what women, I mean, men looked looked for in their wives their capabilities or the way the ways they can entertain them for the rest of their lives in, in a way yeah and you wanted to talk about the regency period as well right yeah yeah okay but like before we before i start saying what i liked about the period i think uh we should give something to the people who haven't watched the show or read the book uh to tell them like what this is about like we said it's about uh, the bridgerton family and basically, I think the book, the book series, like each book, like Nisma said, tells the story of like how they got married, basically. Like the theme in the whole show or series is marriage. It's what like uh, it was about, like the London season of girls coming out, like ready to be snatched by a, by a bachelor. Um, the first, it started with being introduced to society, first yes. of all, as a lady. Mm-hmm. And being in the marriageable age, that's like the highlight of the season. And after that, then you have like balls and... Uh, gatherings where the sole purpose of those meetings is to find a husband or a wife so to say Uh, and like Hanin said that's like the main theme of the novel yes and shows 
And uh, mm-hmm. in the first book and the first season of the show, um, we mainly have Daphne and Simon. Daphne is of age and she came out to society. And like in the show, she was called the diamond of the season. So she's the best of the best. <laughs> <laughs> So she expected like to have suitors, and the reason she didn't is uh, was explained because in the book. of her uh, because of her brothers. Yes, in the show it was because of her brothers, but but in the book it was uh, because she was uh, like everyone saw her as a friend, someone they can talk to and confide in, and like and spend time with, but like not uh to mm. to romance <laughs> in a way like to yeah. fall in love with and court. not physically attracted to. yeah and she was different than the rest of the girls she uh like she has a lot of brothers she has a big family so she's more more outgoing more uh like she's not dainty and quiet and doesn't have anything to talk about you know like yeah they compared her to the rest of uh mm-hmm. women her age uh, and we have Simon. Uh, his father just passed away, and he came back from his travels to receive the, his dukedom <laughs> or his title and uh, to take care of matters. He was invited to a family friend's uh, ball, Lady Danbury, and there he was hounded by mamas <laughs> who wants their daughters to be duchesses. <laughs> Um, and he met Daphne at one of the balls, uh, and they, like, they found the chemistry there, and he's her brother's best friend, but they sort of, like, have a connection, uh, there. They decide to make an agreement, uh, to form an attachment, so the mamas don't, like, count him, <laughs> And she <laughs> becomes attractive to other suitors because, like, I mean, a duke wants her, you know? And that's how, like, the story goes. That's the start of it. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> like we that's said it in the, the show. Summary. Yeah. Like we said in the show, there was more to the brothers and the sisters and to Simon and to that Lady Danbury. And uh, um, there was the queen as well as a character. All of this wasn't... Uh, found there in the book as much or in the first book which we've read well it makes sense because like julia quinn's idea of the series was that each character has their own book Mm -hmm. so the show of course can't really do that because if they do that they will only have a movie at their hands you know if they only take daphne's perspective and simon's story um without the sisters without all the drama behind Mm. it um they they won't have much they Much needed an, yeah, they needed an eight hour of uh, content of events. So, yeah. yes, and I think they tackled it pretty well. So this, you like we've seen that the show was pretty successful, um, very well received, and a <laughs> lot of people were like talking about it and crazy yeah. about it on social media. And so we were like, okay, we have to read the book now. Yes. <laughs> we need to see what it's all about. What originated from the show how is it actually written what was julia quinn's perspective on the characters and Mm -hmm. i think this is the the one thing that intrigued me to read the book you know to really see what was her take on on the characters and we were not disappointed like we got a whole different perspective (laughs) um we had like two completely different characters like even though like we said before the events are the same we still have different reactions mm-hmm. to those events in compared to the TV show and the movie. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. The book. <laughs> the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and like we talked about the casting and everything. Like, what made me want to watch the show and even read the book was the the era. I love that. I love the balls and uh, and dressing in the gowns and. Um, mm. And how people talked, you know, very polite and, and proper. And I, I love that time, you know, uh, even though like women didn't have a lot of uh, what opportunities, say, opportunities or, choices. And, or choices or freedoms. But we were very well taken care of in a way, like 
we were i don't know <laughs> i, I just... mean okay if we're taking it from the perspective of our, of our religion mm-hmm. like our islamic religion what they're doing is not completely wrong because we know that in islam uh muslim women and men should should get married um in order to yeah protect yeah. themselves and if they start and... a courtship uh, there is a chaperone yeah. and and even like the scenes in the ballrooms it's not much different than the scenes in in marriages in islam where like mamas and papas and brothers are uh involved in like the introduction yeah that's so true in the introduction from the start and, yeah yes yeah from the start it's like very serious mm-hmm. you know and i think we lost that kind of yes this uh i'm i'm, I'm sad dedication. To, to lose that like it was safe you know yeah I mean, a courtship isn't a marriage. Like, the mm-hmm. courtship is there for you to figure out whether you can like this person for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, it might sound old-fashioned for some people, but um, we're still in love with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, I don't know, very... I don't know. <laughs> I, I we're can't like find We're, like, out of way. touch. Yeah. Out of touch with it. Yeah. Like, a lot of times, I wish I was in that era just for... Like the ease, the ease of, it, of you know? yes, yeah. Like dressing up and yes, going uh-huh. out with my family to yeah. in in society and like meeting people, you know. Anyway, I just love that year. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times yeah. I say I'm born in the wrong century, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? <laughs> There's a reason for everything. <laughs> yeah. So if you're in that kind of If you love that kind of scene, <laughs> uh, like Bridgerton would be great for you. We yeah. definitely recommend it. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're a fan of Jane Austen, then <laughs> go ahead. Because uh-huh. yes. it plays in the same era, yes. the Regency period. And, and Victoria yeah, as well. Victoria as a Victoria. show in the book by Daisy Goodwin. No, 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 not the same period though. Yeah, but like close. Yeah. Close. Mm-hmm. Close and the same, yeah. like, there was the same values and, you know. That's true, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. The fashion was different. <laughs> but the fashion is definitely different. Yeah. With those weird dresses that, like, where um, the top of the dress starts at the half of your cleavage. Or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. You're like, talking starts... about the Victorian era? No, no. The Regency period, which yeah. is taking place in Bridgerton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the the bust area uh-huh. it starts like in the middle which is such so, such a weird place to start yeah the, the embroidery and like the with, with a half sleeve and then uh, yeah. from below the chest it's just uh, to the floor there is no like right yeah cuttings. i think All the, the reason why the they same. do that <laughs> I think the reason why they do that is because it um, makes your chestal area, I think, a bit smaller. Like, it makes mm. it look smaller. Yeah. And I think that's um, one thing that they wanted to simmer down with the dresses, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's an idea. Anyway, like poor... if there are any experts yeah. from the Regency period <laughs> in fashion, please let us know <laughs> <laughs> why they wore the dresses like that. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's there... like all we have to say for the non-spoiler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe talk about the themes a little bit, like the storyline. It's uh, it, it's close to uh, the storylines of like we pretend we we love each other, you know, <laughs> and, and lie to everyone. At, fall yes, in and love. then they accidentally fall in love, and and they tackle the very important theme, which is friendship in like as a basis for love, you know? Uh, uh-huh. Like, if you if you consider that person as your best friend and then your husband, that's, like, the epitome of marriage or, <laughs> or something. So, yeah. And that was very yeah. well-developed in the show, more than the book. But I loved it. That's true, mm-hmm. yeah. I'll tell you why in the spoiler, why that happened, why the friendship thing was mm-hmm. a little bit interfered. Because I have a theory of why that is the case in the novel. Okay. And then there is the storyline of, uh, like, saving the damaged man and, like, being the light to his dark. <laughs> you know, there is a little bit of that going on. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And that's it, I think. <laughs> For the nun spoiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we come to the heavy part of the episode. <laughs> uh-huh. The the heavier topics. Um because this time I think I took a more analytical approach. <laughs> To the story which is and not like boring at all to be honest like i read your notes and i'm uh-uh. like wow i want to say something to that and that and that you know <laughs> <laughs> let's see then let's. anyway this is uh, where we warn you to stop listening if you haven't read the book and you still want to um if you don't think you're gonna read the book but still want to hear our analysis because if you have watched the, sh- watched the show then you can tag along as well um but yeah shall we get into it yes <laughs> all right you wanted to start with the romantic arc so. Mm-hmm. so recently i started writing uh a script like i'm intending for it to be a romance film um so like i researched like i i know that like all our stories look the same in a way so i like i wanted to see mm-hmm. if there is an arc for that or like uh, an act or no not an act um a formula for it you know uh, <laughs> okay. and funnily enough there were uh, there was uh, so first two people meet with chemistry and dynamic Daphne and Simon <laughs> uh, okay so this is you mean this could be applied to every love story yes every okay. love story interesting so yeah in our case it's Daphne and Simon uh, yeah. in the show they meet uh, in the ballroom when she runs into him Literally. <laughs> and uh, in the book, it's when she was uh, turning down. In the alley. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, no, in the hallway. Uh, when she was turning down that, that insistent suitor. <laughs> and mm-hmm. she punched him. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the thing that comes between them, which is basically... Like, why, why, why the, the conflict or why they can be together or why they want to be together, in our case. <laughs> it's because uh, Daphne wants to marry and Simon doesn't want marriage, but he wants the mamas off his back. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. So they decide to uh, pretend court. <laughs> so they're not, they're still not together, but like there is chemistry there. Yeah. Yeah. And then the spark where, like, they give in to each other and decide, yes, they do love each other and, uh, like, this thing going between them won't work, so they have to be together. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's when uh, they kiss in the garden and then the whole thing with the duel happens and they marry and they find, find blissful happiness together. But yeah. of course, whenever the couple get together, there is something that has to split them apart. <laughs> uh, of course. So, yeah, it comes the split. Like, you're, I'm, I'm telling you this, and I'm sure like every love story you've read is coming to mind Has right now. this arc. <laughs> yeah. This is interesting because I can actually take notes for this. So when, because <laughs> for the novel that I'm writing, which <laughs> yeah, been, true, <laughs> which I have been putting on hold for a while now. Yeah. But uh, this is interesting. I think I can use this. <laughs> yeah. It's... And then we have... Yeah. And then so they split up because like Simon lied to her. Uh, mm-hmm. And she couldn't take that. And he was angry that she is getting... Uh, that she might have a baby. They might have a baby. Mm-hmm. And then the true love conquers all. They decide to be together and fight his demons and have children after all. <laughs> <laughs> And live outside the ghost of its of his father, so happily ever after. <laughs> happily ever after. So that's the end. <laughs> yeah, that's the Duke and I for you, everyone. <laughs> um, we literally just like this was a better summary than <laughs> than the one before. in the non-spoiler, yeah. But yeah. it's spoiling <laughs> that they get yeah, together. Yeah, it does spoil a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this is perfect like the way you applied it and uh where did you get this from from the internet or uh, like it was you did a video research? it was a video on a website called eight hours i used it when i was studying for film it has like analytical videos of films and okay. i wrote romance in the search uh-huh. and i got uh, the analysis for uh before trilogy it's uh 
by Robert Lockenhart, I think. No, it's not. Uh, it's not. It's not a book. It's a uh, movie. A trilogy. A movie trilogy. Uh, mm-hmm. It's very unique. You have to watch it. It's before sunset, before midnight, and before oh, sunrise. Yes, yes, yes. You told me about it. You told yeah, me about it. It's yeah, it's amazing. Okay. So I really yeah. want to watch them. Yeah. Yeah. In the video essay, he applied this arc to uh, the script or like the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, that's very interesting because mm-hmm. even though every love story is unique, in the end, they all follow the same recipe, sort of. Yeah. Because the most important thing, I think, which makes every love story intriguing or for someone to keep reading is the split. Yeah. I think that's one of the most, like... Um, keeping you on your toes moments. Yes, you know? and you keep waiting for them to be together. And how hard is the split, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, for some, it could be like hardcore years not seeing each other. For some, it could be like a month or two. Or for some of them, it could be hours, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. different. Okay. So that was for the romance arc. Um, maybe you guys can take some notes and apply it to other novels. <laughs> Actually, it's fun, yes, when you read or watch a movie with that in mind. And, uh, yeah. I don't know if that will take away the fun magical, of it. Yeah. magic of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Making it look like every love story is the same. Um, anyway. <laughs> Our next point is um, us comparing Simon... Mm-hmm. The character Simon to from the beginning of of the novel versus the ending of the novel. So starting with the novel, um, Simon's backstory is an interesting approach, which I thought because the story starts with his perspective. Mm. So I wanted to bring up the question of whether or not we can consider Simon the protagonist of the story rather than Daphne. Um, mm-hmm. I know this might be some like strange question maybe because it's for some people it might be obvious that Daphne is the protagonist of the story but you know as a literature person we rather like to uh <laughs> provoke some <laughs> yeah some people <laughs> well if as long as I have evidence I can pretty much support my my claim yeah so the story doesn't have a first point of view narration and the protagonist can thus not be really determined easily so we have we constantly switch between Simon, Simon and, Daphne. and Daphne. Yes. Mm-hmm. Although, so, like in the show, we have many perspectives. Yeah, uh, in the show, it's different. Yeah, yeah. We even do have the perspective of Lady Whistledown, narrating over the events. Right. Yes. You know? Yes. So we have her as an extra narrator, which is very different from the book as well. But I. Okay. In, the, in the book, you actually get the excerpts mm-hmm. from the magazine, which yeah. was also really fun. And interestingly enough, when I was reading those, I could actually hear her voice <laughs> yes, reading them. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imitate it, but it was in my head. Yeah. <laughs> With her character, you know. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so you going think back Simon, to Simon is the actual protagonist, although we do have the perspective of Daphne's as well. Yes. On, on events. So okay. I also thought of it as who goes through the stronger development in character. You know, character Simon, development. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> so he changes immensely from the beginning to end. So even though the book series takes on a new Bridgerton character in every book it somehow seems that Daphne was there in the novel purely for Simon's sake. So because mm-hmm. he's the one who has the trauma, the issues, the mental um, blockage in his, yeah, in his character or personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he needs Daphne or he falls in love with her and then this issue is resolved or she helps him overcome this issue. Mm-hmm. If we look at Daphne, Daphne is more of a flat character she doesn't really change much yeah she started with the same goal she got the goal and she's the same at the end like exactly with the same uh, views and needs like usually a round character becomes round when they realize their need not their want Mm -hmm. and uh, simon thought that he wanted to uh, get revenge on his father by by not continuing the hastings line while he actually needed to uh 
live his life like or just be happy you know yeah like uh whether he continues the line or not he has to to do what makes him happy mm -hmm. while while daphne wanted to marry and have a family uh and the husband to love and a love match and that's what she got she didn't realize that she needs something else you know mm -hmm. like the only conflict with daphne's character was her her ignorance of like marital relations and what i mean all that we are going to talk about later but yeah and that that isn't a need you know she she was happy yeah. regardless like mm -hmm. yeah I mean, if we're looking at the TV show, I think Daphne is the center of it because mm -hmm. everything pretty much moves around her. Yes. And Simon just looks more of like a side character added to her life. But in the book, it's completely different because we're in Simon's head all the time. And we see him struggle more than Daphne. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, we can still say Daphne is the protagonist. That's true. Um, I was just like thinking, yeah, <laughs> protagonist, yeah, or maybe they both are, because uh, yeah, we keep switching from from Daphne to Simon, like we said before. Um, also, another point that I wanted to address was uh, Simon's character from the beginning of the novel and Simon's character from the begin in the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm and then compare it to the ending as well so at the beginning they seem very similar but at the end they are very completely different characters hmm. um feel free to object <laughs> <laughs> so i think in the novel near the end he takes more of a misogynistic point of view in the novel so yeah. in, ter in terms of like having babies or not at some point he argues um how daphne's his wife and has to obey him and mm. uh, like and at some point he even acts like she's his property and the type of speech was never used in the show yeah because obviously the show would have gotten a lot of hate for that <laughs> um <laughs> i think yeah. they wanted to take a more feminist approach and uh make him think a little bit different but you could really see um i mean in the media in, in his defense yeah mm, sorry uh, like with the point of like taking the show in a more feminist direction or like not portraying women as uh, as weak or uh, or like mm -hmm. suffer in that way uh, i mean for for years and years and decades they've been trying to to undo what the media did you know <laughs> yeah. to women so I, i understand why they they started to deviate from those uh, portrayals like That's true. Yeah. yeah, but that's on a side note. I mean, like, go on with it. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that in his defense, I mm. think only this kind of behavior came up because uh, his walls came crumbling down. Mm -hmm. At the end, he, like, Daphne really started to see a side of him that nobody else saw. He was and... overwhelmed with emotions that he can't um, analyze or, like... Uh, I mean, feel on on his on his own pace. You know, everything happened mm -hmm. so suddenly, and like he had built this wall and it crumbled, and uh, he felt naked. I think, basically. Uh, yeah, I think it also has something with his um, manhood. You mm -hmm. know, because the way he kept his stutter hidden all these years, and the way he's contained himself as well yes. in society was very well actually but that takes like immense um amount control of self-control and yes self -control. Immense amount of self-control and the way he's losing self-control near the end i think that's what really triggers him because he never really let himself lose control before because he thinks he's a failure you mm. know he thinks if he lets let's go or let's loose um that he will be less of a man Yes, you know? and his father would have won. And I think he was afraid that Daphne would pity him, in a way. Mm. Yeah, you know? yes, that was very... Like, that was even in his monologues. Like, mm. like when she was staring at his mouth, he... Oh, uh, yeah. He was, he, that was a fear. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, so I think the reason why he went into more of a misogynistic point of view is because he was, like, building up that wall again, mm. you know? 
Yeah. Uh, he didn't really want to treat her as his property. He doesn't want to do that. He really loves her. Yeah. But um, and, and I think because he was afraid. Mm -hmm. So he started to treat her a little bit more unfair. And the men in the book are, are different. Like uh, Anthony. Even as a brother, he's not... He's not... He's not controlling as we were used to see uh, in, mm -hmm. in like that yeah, era. Yeah, I was going to talk that about theme. that earlier yeah, yeah. on, yeah. Same goes for Simon. He's not the kind of man who wants a, a property of a wife that wants her dowry and wants to control her every move and wants to, you know. He's not, mm -hmm. he is different from the men in his era as well. So Yeah. So it was shocking when we saw that from him. But like you said, it was... Uh, It was self-defense, sort of, or self-preservation. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> After that, we have Daphne's knowledge of Simon Stutter, which is your point. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to compare, uh, like, how she came to know in the book to how to she came to know in the show. And mm -hmm. what which one do you think was, like, more uh, effective, as in... I don't know <laughs> like in the book it w for me it was more heartbreaking heartbreaking because we're living with his stutter from his childhood and uh, the way he controls himself uh, in, in society even as a man and yeah. and how that reflected on his outer personality you know how people see him mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, he was very stiff at times you mm -hmm. know Like stiff. Yes. Um, his body language was very obvious now that I know what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. um, at times in the novel, you can read where he was struggling with a stutter. So, for example, if in a conversation, his father was brought up. Mm -hmm. His stutter would get would get worse. Yes. Or he would tell himself in like... In his head, yeah. It, yes, in his head that okay don't speak right now because if you speak you would stutter mm -hmm. so he already knows what his trigger points are which is yes. actually already like amazing and mind-blowing because he's so self-aware mm -hmm. you know and we went through this with him so when he did stutter in front of uh, daphne daphne uh mm -hmm. after after she knew about no after she knew about the lie and like confronted mm -hmm. him about it and did what she did It was like a knife to the heart, you know, <laughs> that she she overwhelmed him like this, that she made him lose control, even yeah. though he was at the, in the wrong there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so and, and that even um, supports your claim of him being the protagonist, because like we got to feel for him more than we got to feel for, for, for Daphne. Daphne. Yes. Yeah. And in the book, she knew from the housekeeper, she told her. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the show, it was from the letters, and Lady Dunbury uh, confirmed it. So it was, it was more. I don't know. It was towards the very end. It was in the last episode. <laughs> I felt like it was an afterthought, kid, in the show, or to give, yeah. or to give Lady Dunbury. It's like, oh, by the way, he had a stutter. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so yeah. And we didn't see it as much in the show. Yeah. Like, I think right, he right. only did it once. When he was like, he what did you do? He only stuttered once. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. And like, when he was a child and then once when he was an adult. So, mm. I would have loved to see more of that, to be honest. Like, it was an emotional, very emotional part for me of the story. Uh, mm -hmm. I, would, I would have loved to see it in the show. Yeah. Um, but I think acting out a stutter it takes more skill than mm. you think i thought about that as well i thought not it was every, more about the anyone. cast you know it was about the yeah. actor more than the script maybe uh -huh. or yeah i think maybe he couldn't do it or maybe he didn't do it realistically or maybe he did it and they cut it out yeah maybe uh, maybe you know right yeah Yeah, maybe there I were think sequences really needs... or a scene, and then they they cut it out. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, it could it be wasn't possible. Working Who knows? With the whole arc of the episode, <laughs> for example, not the show or 
Yeah. Who knows? I I always wish I'm in their head, you know, <laughs> when they're de- making these decisions. <laughs> and when I, now when I hear that, like, a book is going to be turned into a show or a movie, I want to be there, you know, from the beginning to tell them, no, do this and not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the next topic that I wanted to talk about was parenting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We have a lot of parenting (laughs) going on. It is a strong theme, yes. It is a strong topic there, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So we have, um, starting in the prologue on page 11, we have Simon felt the Duke's rejection in his very bones, felt a peculiar kind of pain enter his body and creep around his heart. And as hatred flooded his body and poured from his eyes, he made a solemn vow. If he couldn't be the son his father wanted, then by God he'd be the exact opposite. So in this part, I... First of all, like we were very fascinated, like we said, when we had Simon's perspective at the very beginning, because Mm -hmm. it was paving the way to a wholly different story, you know? Um, So this was kind of... um, interesting because i was thinking about the parenting and what what does this do to a child growing up Mm -hmm. constantly feeling like they are disappointment to their parent yeah and you can really see the damage that has been done through his yes in his personality and his character throughout the story dreams and his goals and yeah but also on how he was hurt hard on himself yes he improved to prove himself Uh but wow like the way he even pushed himself in college mm-hmm. um, and used his father's um, need for a better reputation to g- yeah. to move up to move up in the world. Mm-hmm. So he knew his father would never stab him in the back in public yeah. because he yes. wanted the Hastings name to remain flawless. Yeah. So whatever his son did, he just brushed it over or even. Um, went out of his own way to make it better you know make it his idea even (laughs) yeah make it his idea exactly Um, in a way (laughs) yeah but yes the damage parenting could do the the problems that could be avoided in Mm -hmm. in this child's adult life you know and the effect it has not only on that child but the people around him yeah the happiness of the people around him because if he's not happy that will influence other people's happiness yes um and i also want to address the uh, the idea of father son relationship because a son needs his father mm-hmm. and um there are things that only a father can teach his son so a father being absent from a son's life can also be like make a huge damage on that Uh, so for example we have simon simon stutter Mm -hmm. in chapter 2 page 37 we have a quote that says simon tried oh how he tried but no one had the ability to crush his confidence like his father and as he start stared at the duke who might as well have been a mirror image albeit slightly older older version of himself he couldn't move couldn't even try to speak so that is crushing to read, you know. Yes, very. To like, to have this like effect how many on, times, on someone. How many times were we reproached by our fathers and punished for something we did as children? And how small and afraid we felt at that moment. Yeah. Like now it seems funny, <laughs> but but then at this very at the moment where we we're like six years old and seven years old and ten years old and like our fathers are like shouting us at us for something we did. It's. Uh, like how afraid and small and helpless we felt then yeah and to and and this is like we're like what i'm talking about is normal it's like (laughs) how life goes but what simon went through is definitely not normal like no not even Uh being accepted by his father and i think simon sort of still got through pretty well like the confidence he had in himself was still high Yes. You know, he believed in himself in mm-hmm. ways that um, nobody else did. And yes, his the way he got there was pretty harsh. And traumatizing. And yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think the irony of it all is that all of that is thanks to his father. 
mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> the way he yeah. wants to prove him wrong or mm-hmm. to make him feel like he's missing out on something, you know. Yes, it worked out fine. Not f- it did, not, yeah. Not, not great, but like fine. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but this brings out to um, brings us to another discussion, mm-hmm. which is I think a very touchy subject. So I'm going to first start with the quote and then we go in with the discussion. So I think this is Daphne speaking. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. We'll see. Or thinking. So, but no ma- yeah. But no matter how deep his pain or how wounded his soul, he was going about this all wrong. The best revenge against his father would simply be to live a full and happy life, to achieve all those those heights and glories his father had been so determined to deny him. So... The previous quote where we said Mm -hmm. um, living a full and happy life and achieve those heights his father tried to deny him that's the best revenge he could ever possibly pursue I wanted to see whether or not this is true like I wanted to see your opinion on it as well well it would be true if that is something that Simon yearns for one day or yearned for and is denying himself but Mm -hmm. if it's something that's not on his mind and would not be on his mind ever then no it's not true like now he is happy and living a full life for himself you know as like what he thinks you know but in the book in the show or like in the story he didn't want to marry because of that but at the same time he he doesn't want to be alone Mm -hmm. so he changed his mind about one thing of the two things that he was denying himself you see to to get revenge on his father so who says that he wouldn't eventually change his mind about the other thing right but i also wanted to go back to the scene with the father before he died i think this was in the tv show and not Uh, in the book book, where he said right in like on his deathbed Mm -hmm. he was saying that please have a son or please have an heir Mm. And he like literally like almost spit in his face and said no. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But, he wasn't mentioning that Simon gets an heir, but like he was the perfect heir or whatever. So he was like, yeah. Uh, but you know what? It's gonna die with me. <laughs> Something yeah, along right. these lines. Yeah. Right. That was the one. Mm. So that was the promise he made. Like he's not gonna produce an heir in order for the Hastings name to live on. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of the quote that we read previously. I also wanted to address Daphne in the situation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to question her sincerity. I just want to say, like, of course she cares about him and loves him. But the idea of it, like the situation, she wants a kid. She wants to have children. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in this moment she would literally say anything. (laughs) (laughs) Now to make him believe that if he had a child, it would not mean that his father won. Because in terms of family i think she's the one who wants it the most Mm -hmm. and not simon so in terms of that she's just trying to convince him that it's a good idea you know yeah so in my opinion i find it quite the opposite and can definitely side with simon on this one because for some reason i can really understand his anger and his need to hold on to it he knows that his father wished to have an heir and simon so simon did everything within his power to make that wish impossible and this was a man he resented all his life and he owed nothing to him, even though he, it is his biological father, but he treated him very badly. So how come Simon gets to win if he chooses to live a happy life? This is my question. Hmm. And I, I see, I see it. But because yes, if Daphne ha- had thought that like mm-hmm. a, lo- a happy life from Simon's perspective, that whether exactly. that entails children or not mm. you know i mean okay there was one quote um at the end which could crush this whole statement um mm-hmm. because i found it last night and i was like <laughs> okay <laughs> oops <laughs> maybe shouldn't have gone there but uh Okay, so the quote goes like this. They were He was talking to Anthony, and Anthony was talking about all the responsibilities that he had for the family. And then Simon goes and says, I don't envy your, you your responsibilities in that quarter. But even as he said those words, he felt a strange longing, and he wondered what if it would be, what it would be like 
to not be quite so alone in this world. Had no plans to, he had no plans to start a family of his own, but maybe if he'd had one to begin with, his life would have turned out a bit differently. And I think this is the key, mm-hmm. you know. Like I said, if he like he at first he didn't want to wife, so he doesn't have an heir, and then he got himself a wife because like he doesn't want to be alone, and then mm-hmm. he he wouldn't want them to be up. Maybe yes, and now he's thinking. If I had a happy family, I would have wanted this. And yeah. then what if I have a family and then it's different, you know, like, yeah. And this goes back on Daphne because Daphne grew up in a healthy family, mm-hmm. sort of. We're going to get back to <laughs> Daphne in a minute. <laughs> yes, sort of. <laughs> Cute. Sort of, but um, I think that's why she wanted a family as well. Mm-hmm. Because she has this um, huge role model in front of her. Yes. Which her mother, Violet. Um, and their marriage. And her father and mother and mother's marriage. like Yeah. And she's a single mother. Imagine that. She's a widow. widow. Mm. But look at her managing the life with so many family members. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though she's a woman and uh, the head of the family is supposed to be Anthony, I f- still feel like she has a lot of control yeah over them more in the novel than in the show Mm -hmm. just because she's a mother you know she knows how to to give their children take care of her children give them what they need to feel Mm -hmm. like manly or girly or whatever (laughs) and then (laughs) and then like help them do what needs to be Mm -hmm. done what she thinks is right and yeah, she was she was a strong head of a family just because she's a great mother. And all was based on, like, love. You're like, she loves them. They love each other. I mean, okay, one funny part in the novel with, with the whole baby, ha- having babies thing. Mm-hmm. I found it ironic that when Simon finally decided to go for it, yeah, uh, she kept asking him, no, don't do this because of me. Do it because you want it. Shut up. <laughs> you, know, you finally got him where you wanted. And yes. now you want him to do it because he wants it. It's, you know, it's like, yeah. but yes, like the, do this, you want it or not? <laughs> this also speaks for her intentions. Like she, she does yeah. really want him to be happy and not like live in the mm-hmm. shadow of this yeah, that's true. revenge. Yeah. I mean, like I said before, I don't want to question her sincerity in yeah, the moment. Yeah. Like, I, I really believe she wants him to be better and to feel like having a family is important and the right thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but it feels like she's pushing in the wrong time, you know? Mm. Because before, she made it clear that she wants a family, you know? And he doesn't. But he doesn't. Why, does he, why doesn't he want it? Because he hasn't thought about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it was never an option for him before. Yeah. So he never really considered it. Why, why linger on something that is not an option for you? Because he didn't um, grow up normally knowing he... Yeah. Like, being in a family and knowing that he would have his own family just like this one. Mm-hmm. And, and so he would come of age and look for a wife. He didn't grow up with these aspirations. He just... Grew up to, true, yeah. to, to defy his father, to get over his stutter, to excel at everything and like not to, not to look forward to life, you know? All right. I think we covered Simon in mm-hmm. the parenting department. <laughs> now we move on to Violet. <laughs> the actual parent. <laughs> the actual parent, yeah. So one of the major questions I think we can ask ourselves about Violet is, did Violet fail as a mother, you know? Fail who? Because that's fail Daphne because in in some ways I think uh yes we have a more like feminist feminist point of view in the tv show so for example Eloise doesn't even want to get married Mm -hmm. actually we never really saw Violet's reaction on that to Eloise's despise on that topic she, she at the end she decided not to rush her and to wait until she's ready yeah. to go out in society she doesn't it doesn't have to be this year she she well the difference the difference with Daphne is that she wants to get married mm-hmm. and wants to have a family so that's something else so but did not her really mother, her. mother prepare her fully for that role according to the that's book that's the question Daphne, no <laughs> 
So for example, in chapter 13, page 210, we have Violet trying to explain to Daphne what happens on the wedding night <laughs> between man and wife. Did she fail her daughter in not preparing her well enough? Yes, because that la led in the end to her being really embarrassed, mm -hmm. uh, taken advantage of a little. Yeah, just being miserable because she she didn't know something. She f she felt like a fool, you mm -hmm. know, and I ca can really understand that. Yeah. Um, but I also wanted to d address the fact that these days we don't have that talk anymore as well. So everything most people know... They know from the media. From, they know from the TV or the internet or the media. So the talk, you know, is n no longer a necessary thing because it is mostly obvious mm. what is done on the wedding night. So, yeah. um, but what I find crazy is that it's a thing that just happens and it cannot be controlled by the parents because at some points the kids are going to get curious and just look up stuff on the internet and get their answers. Yeah. Um, because, like, who wants to go ask mom, mom and dad? dad and make it awkward, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, honestly, I think it's a very hard topic to talk about, especially with your kids. Yeah. And But I think, in a way, we can envy Violet because and the women of the Regency period in general because the purity and the innocence that mm -hmm. is within these women is very um, real and yeah. right to the core, mm -hmm. you know? So I think if you have this opportunity where girls have no knowledge whatsoever and you have a blank slate, you know, you yeah. can really educate them of what should be done or yeah. what can be done or, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that even though it might be uncomfortable for a parent, I think it's their job yeah. to educate, especially those who don't know, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, come on, come on. <laughs> Like the or, words that no, or even, okay. Like, or even when they, they they turn like a certain age or they're still mm -hmm. like when they start being teenagers, I think yeah. it's better that the parents control what the children know, you know? Yeah. At an early age, like and tell them everything they need to know. In a mm -hmm. way. That's true, yeah. I mean the way people have the talk in Europe about safe you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, protecting themselves, birth control, all that stuff. We should have in our society the talk about... But the thing is, like, we... In our religion, um, that part only starts when you get married, mm. you know? So why educate them before, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. Sp like, what I like about... No, what I found weird is the timing of her talk mm. uh, right before the wedding night. Yeah. You know, I think this should have been done like a week before the wedding night or like a when, month before that. When a proposal happened, you know, like I understand yes. why they want, they, does, they don't want to say, to tell their girls these things when they come out in society. So it doesn't mm -hmm. happen before a marriage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at least, yeah, when they have secured a proposal, they should have like been talked to. <laughs> because I think as well, like as a girl or as a woman in Daphne's case, is that she will have a lot of questions, you know, and she needs time to process what, what, what she will have to do as a wife. And um, like... Like, exactly, if she has any more questions, like, if she tells it right before the wedding night, when when would she have the chance to to, <laughs> to ask, you know? Because yeah. the next day she will be on her in her carriage riding off into the sunset mm. and there's no phone to call her mom. Like, yeah. hey, <laughs> hey, mom, remember that thing you told me last night? I have a couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think... I mean, nowadays, the parents have it easier because most of the stuff we can just look up and educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, like, I personally, I don't know. Like, if my kid is older, like, in their 20s or something, mm -hmm. and they have questions and they feel embarrassed, all right, I mean, I would understand why they would go on the internet and just ask the question. Like, what if yeah. it's something simple, nothing big? Yeah, sometimes children are like, maybe that's from experience. Like, I wouldn't want to go ask my mom because I don't want her to know I'm thinking about these stuff <laughs> now, you know? <laughs> no, why, 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 you know? 
<laughs> yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Anyway, but personally, I think that during this period and even like, like give or take a century, like the century before that and the century after that, like say the 17th, 18th, or like no, the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, for example. <laughs> uh, people, I think like the the talk was actually related to uh to status if you were one of the ton like they they call them in the book you wouldn't have this conversation with your children or with your siblings or the, or with your parents wow because it's inappropriate you know it's yeah. not taboo it's not it's not a polite conversation <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but like I mean it's not for conversation definitely not. yeah but like for discussion uh, yeah. but uh, the poor people who not even like I'm not even talking about the the help like which was apparent in the book that they knew knew more than the people of the house <laughs> Wow. Uh, about these things uh, hmm. I'm talking about like really poor people it was even like this claim is supported by the same again, the idea came to me even from um, Anne with an E hmm. uh, like when she went to school and she talked about this stuff with, with her uh, friends at school uh, she knew about it because she was in a household in a poor household where like she wasn't shielded oh, from that intimacy like, you know from what you're saying this is all just about etiquette yes and what's appropriate mm-hmm. and and, yeah. and 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 like where you're living if you're living in a big mm-hmm. house you wouldn't be exposed to 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 it you know but if you're living oh in a house that is only one room and a living room of course yeah. you would be exposed to this as a child so you would know stuff But remember that scene in the show. <laughs> It was so funny with Eloise. She came into the room. She was like, how does a woman become to be pregnant with child? It's like, I thought she was supposed to be married. And there's like, apparently it's not even a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That, that was very forward in the show because like, yeah. they were open about things. Unlike in the book, it was more true to the era, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very interesting topic because um, I think it it shows as well that it, as a parent, you have a task, you know, mm-hmm. in that area as well, even though it might be uncomfortable. And you might have kids who are like courageous enough to approach you mm. <laughs> like hey mom what does what what does that mean <laughs> like, yeah where did you hear that word <laughs> like M- mom never speak to me again <laughs> how, how did we come into this world <laughs> yeah yeah these questions you know yeah. when when god blesses a couple or when Like, this is what mom and dad told me when I was younger. Uh-huh. That when you get married, just God gives you a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what that's what they told me. I mean, it's kind of true. Yeah. Kind of. I don't remember uh, what they told me if I, or if I even asked them. I don't really remember how I found out. I think it was at some point in... In school, some of the kids were, like, talking about it. And I was yeah. like, what the hell are you talking about? We're talking about this and that and that and that. I was like, oh, my God. What? <laughs> A whole new world has opened. <laughs> We can just skip to the next topic because we've been talking about this for too long. <laughs> yeah. We wanted um, to discuss uh, Anthony's character. Mm, yes. So we have, with Anthony, we have... Two different characters, actually. One in the show and one in the book. Mm-hmm. So in the show, he was depicted as this very controlling character who even at one point forced his sister to marry a suitor because he was the only one available. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at some point, I think, uh, in the show, his, uh, her mother uh, pushed Anthony to make a decision. Mm. And then he made the wrong one entirely. Remember? Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. 
And then some of his actions that he took in the show did not seem really justifiable and came off as sort of a hypocritical character. So mm. a lot of his his motivations, so for example, even the duel that he, he asked Simon ab- after Simon and Daphne kissed, mm. didn't seem like he was doing it to defend Daphne's honor. I think he was just pissed at Simon. In the book, it was. It felt more like he wanted to protect her honor. It did feel like he was still pissed at him. Yeah. But it felt more like etiquette, mm-hmm. you know? Like, okay, you did this, you tarnished her reputation, now you have to pay the consequences, you know? Mm. And it was even strangely portrayed in the novel. Like, the only thing that Anthony really said, quote, like, literally, he said, see you at dawn. Yeah. And... I thought that was so interesting, the way he just challenged him. Like, he doesn't say, I'll challenge you to a duel to protect my sister's honor. Like, those words were never really uttered. So, see you see you at dawn was already something that Simon knows as a consequence, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And this is like the men talking to each other, mm-hmm. you know? Like, uh, there's not even a go- negotiation. Like, I won't even talk to you. Yeah. Like, you can complain as much as you want but i'll see you at dawn okay yes yeah (laughs) this is happening so it felt more justifiable in the novel because we have anthony's character in the novel starting off which was very interesting as well him knowing about the plan between daphne and simon Mm -hmm. yes that was very different from the show yeah and which brings us back to the friendship thing Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why the friendship thing was so intense in the show is because only Simon and Daphne knew about the plan. Mm-hmm. So it was something intimate between them. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like we're doing this forbidden thing no one knows about. And that really sort of makes it attractive. Yeah. You know, um, and I think that's the reason why their bond was like intensified in the and, show and, a little bit and more. Be- and because of the arrangement itself, that they know they're not for each other. So they can talk openly, you know, they're not courting. So she doesn't have to be a very, uh, like, uh, dainty or, you know, (laughs) or he has to be very polite. Like, they even open topics that are improper in in society. Yes, just because they're friends, you know. True. And I really loved Anthony's character in the novel because... He wasn't annoying in the least. He mm. was very protective for, for the right reasons. Yes. He even put a lot of consideration into how his sister is feeling yes. and her, self, her, self, yes, uh, he, her self-esteem, yeah. you know? Yeah. He knows that she has this problem in the, and put a lot of thought into her self-esteem. He recognized that his sister doesn't see herself as attractive or someone anyone mm-hmm. would love and like... As a brother, yeah. that's very, like, they're very close in that way. Like, uh... mm-hmm. But at some point, like, starting with the plan that Simon and Daphne had, um, it was actually, in the book, it was actually Daphne's idea, I think. Mm. I'm not quite sure. No, 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 it was Simon's idea, sorry. Yeah. Um, later on, like, after Simon uh, kissed Daphne, you could really see that the rational mind of Anthony just switched off. Mm. And then the overprotective, angry brother came out. Yes. And that overprotective, angry brother was in the show the whole time. (laughs) You know, the whole time from Mm. start to finish. And that was annoying. Like, I think they could have pretty, like, made his character a little bit more understanding, you Mm. know? I didn't like his, the, this, even his hairstyle just pissed me off. I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> his hair was like always so messy ben- benedict was the most attractive of the brothers yes that's yeah. true yeah so yeah i think anthony's also an interesting character because he's gonna be our next character in the viscount who loved me yeah so i even th- like i already love him as a character in the book so i'm very interested to see what is going to happen with him in uh, in the next book but you can really see like the portrayal of manhood and chivalry and like protecting a woman's honor is like very serious in the book yes you know and it, it's something that's that is essential it's a rule uh-huh. in society and simon was already willing to take it you know 
he was going to be a gentleman and not point the gun at Anthony or not mm-hmm. shoot at him, but he was pretty sure that Anthony was going to shoot him, <laughs> <laughs> which was also kind of funny. So it's like suicide. <laughs> okay, last but not least. <laughs> Or like feminism, yeah. <laughs> which we were underlying our topic, our talk with throughout the yeah chapter. Mm-hmm. But like first, before you go into uh, specific uh, events or quotes that uh, yeah. portrayed feminism, can you mm-hmm. explain it to me? What is feminism? You mean, what is feminism? <laughs> yeah, because because like you know, it's one of the those things that like. You just say, I'm a feminist, and like, you don't know what feminism is, is you know? <laughs> uh, okay, feminism, I think, is for, wow, okay, it's like about women's rights and wanting to be equal mm-hmm. um, to men, okay? okay? Not to be more, more, not to have more value than men, but to be equal. Okay, have the same opportunities. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so in, in terms of, um that topic i think in in uh, julia quinn's novel it's very interesting the way she depicted it like i kept seeing that she gave daphne every now and then a little bit of power and control Mm -hmm. and then taking it away again Mm -hmm. and i think one of the very good quotes that is in the novel which portrays this perfectly even simon said this is from simon's perspective Mm. He said they were both trapped, Simon realized, trapped by their society's conventions and expectations. Mm. Because I wanted to go back on the uh, reputation thing. Mm -hmm. Because even though Simon and Daphne were in love, um, which makes them lucky in this point. Yeah. But I think if we're going to look at it from a different perspective, if someone, if a man comes and steals a kiss from her and uh, her brother finds out and she doesn't love this man, um, the only two options are he marries her because he had already claimed her, so mm. to say, um, or or did yeah or the duel touched her or yeah yeah or a duel. Or so a duel. there's two options in which okay? in which she would lose that man or lose her brother. Exactly. Or so her father again. Again, yeah. this this idea of society's conventions and expectations. So the reason why Daphne ran to Simon in the duel is because she found out that somebody else knows. Mm. Okay, so she was sort of forced into the marriage, you know, Mm. but again, it's something she wanted. So she was lucky in this department because they have feelings for each other. But I think it would have been really bad if it was someone she didn't have feelings for. So this is what I'm saying, like the idea of having her power and not having her power. So she she's forced to marry him, but she also wants to marry him. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. This this gameplay, giving her power and not really. Which so, was interesting. <laughs> which is very interesting because at some point you you think about it and um, you wonder, you know, did she do this because she wanted to or because she had to, you know? And yeah, so that's also one of, one of the points that I wanted to address. Another scene was when he saw her in the hallway mm-hmm. and that other gentleman... Um, we can't really call him a gentleman because yeah. he was drunk. <laughs> um, the other guy. Nigel. I can't recall. Nigel. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, was um, sort of approaching her and she didn't like it. She kept telling him to stop. But then Simon, uh, the quote goes, Simon turned around groaning. It looked like he was going to have to rescue the chit after all. He strode back into the hall, putting his sternest, most duckish expression on his face. The words, I believe the lady asked you to stop, rested on the tip of his tongue. But it seemed that he wa- wasted, f- uh, wasn't fated to play the hero tonight. <laughs> after all, because before he could make a sound, the young lady pulled back her right arm and landed a surprisingly effective punch squarely on Nigel's jaw. <laughs> So, again, giving her the power. Yes. You know, that's what I mean. Like not being because... the damsel in distress in that yes. situation. And Simon exactly. the hero. And I think Simon at some point was feminist as well when when he didn't accept her dowry. And uh, Yeah. I mean, he didn't need it. That's why he didn't Yeah, he it. didn't need <laughs> it. But he also was thinking about her self-esteem. Again, that he... They were put in that situation where they have to marry... And uh, mm. and he's and he's not like going to make her feel like she paid him to marry her, you know. Yeah. 
and uh, that again is giving her the power back you know <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, in some way and then we have as well I'm sh- the quote says from Daphne I'm sure I would take a first in if Oxford would only see fit to admit women mm, it was a so first in that's... history I think yeah that's a comment about like how women weren't educated as men and weren't given the same opportunity mm-hmm. in education back then yeah so that's feminism mm-hmm. that's the proper feminism in the Being show however <laughs> There In was the a show, lot however. of that, like yeah. Eloise, her voicing, not wanting to just marry. Um, yeah. In. Uh, I'm so else? interested. Yeah, the opera in singer. Her novel. The opera singer saying, "I will find myself a gentleman who would take care of me," and you know, like mm-hmm. there is power not in that. Not settling. Yeah, not yeah. settling. And uh, even uh, Madame de la Croix. Like having her own shop and not depending on anyone. But I think, again, the whole um, introducing women to society objectifies women a little as well. Of course. But... but, And that it's like a competition. mm -hmm. You know, who's more perfect? Who's more beautiful? Who's... (laughs) You know, uh, it could bring other women down. Yeah, the way they're doing it, that there is a season and there is, you know... uh, but but if we if we not lay it on thick in our society and just make events where families mingle, where the gentlemen eligible and the ladies uh, eligible are in the mm-hmm. same place and it's like that uh, civil way, <laughs> it would be more for the man and the woman, you know. That's true. And that was our last topic <laughs> for the day. <laughs> we did it. Yes, this is one quite long episode, but the book deserves it, and the show, yeah. and the and the topics themselves, and the the story. Like, mm-hmm. I, like I said in the non spoiler, I lo- love, 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 love those eras. Like you know the simple the simple way of like if you say the the first name of the man or the woman you're quitting that makes it intimate you know like just Mm -hmm. that simple you know imagine (laughs) imagine elizabeth was was calling mr darcy william you know that he would have been brought to his knees i'm sure (laughs) wow (laughs) i can't even imagine (laughs) okay um that was it for today everyone uh we had a lot of fun talking about Bridgerton the Duke and I uh, we can't wait for the next one we I don't know if we're we're probably gonna wait for the second season to come out mm-hmm. for us to read um the Viscount who loved me the yeah the Viscount who loved me I think I'm gonna read it before the season comes out but just because I want to have a different perspective this time yeah maybe close to it okay I'll wait for the uh, TV show edition. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Our next read is going to be uh, Outlander, Outlander, which is the last yeah. uh, chapter in this year. And yeah, then... because we measure our episode with... We started in September mm-hmm. last year, yeah. right? Yes. We no, started the in year, September. The year, the year before, before that. that. Yes, it's been oh two years. Oh my God. Yeah. Wait, so this is our third year? Yeah, we're starting our third year. Oh my god. Yeah. This is mind blowing. Yes. <laughs> what? Three years? No way. <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh my god. And, this and, makes and me like so happy. A year before that, where we were preparing and recording episodes. Yeah. And... So technically four, but three we've been posting. Yeah. Wow. Wow, we've come a long way. Mm-hmm. Anyway whoever has done it to the end of this episode thank you for listening (laughs) we are grateful that you're here (laughs) definitely and we'll see you next time see you next time thank you for making it till the end of this chapter we certainly enjoyed recording it as some of you are aware next month is september the 30th is international podcast day We started on this day in 2019, so this makes it our anniversary as well. Depending on how you look at it, next chapter is the ending of this podcast here, or the beginning of another. That's why, for chapter 37, we chose for you an epic story that transcended space and time. 
you might have guessed, <laughs> Outlander by Diana Gavaldon. Three years ago, the show captured our hearts, and it's time to consume the original work. Let us know if you want us to create chapters for the rest of the books in the series, and which one was your favorite. Mark the page for chapter 37.